Uh, welcome back from lunch, everyone. Hope everyone had a good break. Um, so to start off this afternoon, uh, I will be talking about policy gradient methods, um, which is another large area of, of reinforcement learning, which takes a little bit of a different approach to training uh, our agents than the Q-learning approaches we saw before lunch. So as we previously mentioned, Q-learning can't handle continuous action spaces, which can be definitely a bit of an issue. So a lot of environments, let's say robotic environments, will require you to apply a continuous control, let's say torque to a joint. And the reason we can't handle this with Q-learning is because, as you may recall, we need to take an argmax over the Q values. So it would be nice if we had a, a way of, of, of dealing with continuous action spaces. Q-learning also doesn't allow us to deal with stochastic policies. So in training, we need to have a separate approach in order to balance our exploration and exploitation. We have this separate epsilon greedy algorithm. And it would be great if we had a way of dealing with exploration and exploitation, which was inherent to the model and allow us to per perhaps use some sort of concept of, of uncertainty. Also in certain scenarios, even during inference, we might wanna use a stochastic policy in these partially observable environments that John previously mentioned. And finally, Q-learning doesn't actually directly optimize the policy. We're not directly optimizing for a goal. We're optimizing for these Q values, which although they tell us the, 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 the value of a current state in action, they actually end up being essentially a proxy for a proxy for um, our, our policy and how we would like to best uh, interact with the environment. So policy gradient really aims, really the heart of it is to aim to optimize for the policy directly instead, instead of using these surrogate Q values. So as I just mentioned, the policy gradient methods directly optimize a parameterized function. So we have this policy here denoted as pi, and we take in the state and we output a distribution over actions and we parameterize it with, with some parameters data. Um, we will we'll be using the notation on, on the right here for this. And what we do is we train our policy by optimizing a maximization problem. We want to maximize some measure of our performance, J. And this is a very what this would look like with a very simple update iteration step. We're going to take our parameters and take the gradient. And here, since we're maximizing, we're gonna, we're gonna add the gradient times some learning rate in order to update our, our, our parameters. And for example, this, this measure of performance could be our expected return uh, given the current policy parameters. So we have an expectation over the traces, the traces given our current policy um, and an expectation over the return of these traces. We want to essentially try to maximize this. We want to do as well as possible given um, the stochasticity of, of the environment. And this is nice because this is, we're actually directly optimizing the policy, which is quite intuitively appealing. We don't have to kind of get around this by using Q values that we're learning and as well as like some epsilon greedy, some epsilon greedy approach. All right, so like I said, we are going to take the expectation over our, our, the expectation over expected rewards, and we're going to take the gradient of this in order to update our parameters. But pretty quickly, we realize that this isn't as straightforward as it initially looks because we're taking a gradient over an expectation. And then this gradient is tricky, both because the action selection, which is it directly depends on the policy. So this action selection here, and also the rewards depend on the policy. So we have an indirect dependency on the policy in this term here. Fortunately, um, the policy gradient theorem, which really is allows us to do this policy gradient approach. And I omit the proof here because it's, it's, it's quite long, but you can find it on the website. There's, there's some links to some good explanations of the, of the, the proof. Um, but the policy gradient theorem tells us that this gradient over an expectation of the, the episode returns is actually proportional to an expectation of the rewards times the gradient of the log probabilities of our actions for our current policy. So this theorem has allowed us to 
change a gradient of an expectation, which is quite unclear how to compute, into an expectation over an expression involving a gradient, uh, which we're actually able to estimate. Um, and we'll actually do that in, in the next slide using a, a reinforce algorithm. So um, the reinforce algorithm. So the reinforce algorithm allows us to ex estimate this expectation on the right using the Monte Carlo estimates of using episode rollouts. And we're gonna walk through this algorithm step by step. So first we initialize our parameters at random. So for example, in the case of a neural network, this would be the weights and the biases. Then we generate a trajectory on policy. So using the current policy, we generate a trajectory and then for each time step in that trajectory, we're going to get the episode return um, or the reward to go, which is just a discounted episode return. And then we're going to update our policy parameters using this episode return. So we're going to say that uh, we take our learning rate here, our return from step number one here, and we're going to multiply that by the gradient of the log probability. And then this, by repeating this process, this allows us to get an estimate of um, this, this term on the right here. And reinforce is actually not unique to policy gradients. Um, you actually might've seen it in other places um, and it's a more general algorithm to estimate gradients when the function is non-differentiable due to, due to an expectation. Um, important to note actually as well that this process for estimating the expectation is on policy. In order for this estimate to be correct, we need to be following this policy um, this parameters policy here, um, which is different than what we saw in, in DQN previously, where we could both use on and off policy approaches. So in practice, what does this look like? Well, we can model our policy using a neural network, which takes in the current state as the input and outputs a distribution over actions. So in this case, our parameters are the weights and the biases of the network. And if we're modeling a continuous action space, like I said, we would be able to. Um, it's often an assumption that we'll model it with a Gaussian uh, distribution and we can reparameterize our network accordingly. So if we had, um, in that case, what it would look like is our, our network would output a, um, a, a mean and a variance. And this can obviously be extended to multiple dimensions as well if we have a more complex action space. And then in practice also, instead of maximizing an ob objective, what we actually do is we minimize a surrogate loss, which gives us the desired gradient. So we have this surrogate loss here, and we see that when we take um, the negative gradient of this surrogate loss and do it updates, it gives us the update step that we saw in the reinforce algorithm um, on, on the previous slide. All right, so to quickly summarize the last three slides, this is what it's gonna look like when we actually train our, our policy gradient, um, our policy gradient, um, user policy gradient algorithm. Um, so we're gonna collect episodes by sampling from our current policy. We're gonna iterate over each time step and compute the loss by using the reward and log probabilities um, of, of the actions in the rollout. And finally, we're gonna update the policy neural network based on the mean of these computed losses. Um, and then once again, it's, it's often beneficial to batch multiple time steps or episodes together um, and take the mean across uh, their losses to reduce the variance in, in the model updates. Um, as well, during training, uh, you might have noticed that we actually don't have this, this, this need for this epsilon greedy algorithm. By sampling from our policy, since it's a distribution over actions, we naturally balance exploration and exploitation. At the beginning, since it's randomly initialized, our actual distribution has lots of exploration. We don't know what the best action to pick is. However, as the training progresses, the policy starts favoring high value actions and we start exploiting a lot more and exploring less. We're, certain, we're more certain about which actions we need to be taking and we start taking those actions more frequently. So there's kind of this 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 implicit uh, balance, um, and as uh, the exploration naturally balances itself during training, which is quite nice. And then during inference, we can simply take the maximum of our of our action dis distribution. Um, that being said, in certain situations, as I previously mentioned, you could also uh, sample from your action distribution during um, inference. For example, if you're dealing with partially observable states, or if you have multiple um, 
multiple optimal actions that it might be beneficial to sample. One more thing to note is that um, on, in the training, um, policy gradient training, each update actually impacts all the actions for the given state, because of course it's a distribution. This is different than in Q-learning where our updates really are focused on a single state action pair, right? So if we think of the scenario of TQL, what we're updating is a single entry in, in the table. And, but when we deal with policy gradient, we're actually updating all the actions for a given state every time we update. So you can, although we're kind of forced to be on policy in policy gradient, these updates can kind of be seen as more powerful because you're um, providing more information uh, at, at each update. Okay, so to summarize the advantages and disadvantages. So as I mentioned, the policy gradient approaches allows you to handle stochastic policies and there's kind of this intrinsic balance of exploration and exploitation. Um, we handle continuous action spaces very nicely. Um, and then perhaps most importantly, we're actually optimizing for a goal directly instead of using surrogate Q values. However, there's still some downside. So the reinforced estimates here, this estimates of the, the, the expected return these estimates can have quite high variance, which leads, can lead to a lot of instability in the training. Um, furthermore, uh, one, what, like we saw when looking at the reinforce algorithm, we can only use on policy updates. So the sample efficiency is a lot worse in DQN because in DQN, you can both use on and off policy um, samples. And then also policy gradients are often prone to, to local optima. So a lot of the extensions that we're gonna see on top of policy gradients, such as um, the ones we'll be discussing in, in the next sections are really focused on improving um, the, the stability of the algorithm um, and kind of reducing this variance, this high variance we're seeing due to the, the reinforced estimates of uh, the gradients of the expected return.